Mary Ann Street. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to support uh, this legislation uh, introduced by the Minister, who's just resumed his seat. And at its third reading, I have to say uh, that I've been feeling sorry for the Minister. This should have been a reasonably pedestrian piece of legislation to usher through the House. It had the support of the Labour Party uh, and only the dissenting voice from the Green Party for the reasons that they have described previously in this debate. However, having loaded this legislation into urgency for no good reason, because in fact it could have been dealt with in December, it was reported back, uh, the report of the Select Committee was presented to the House on the 27th of November. If I remember correctly, we sat quite late in December. It could have been dealt with in the ordinary scheme of things with uh, uh, sufficient attention being paid to it and allowing for it to be in time by the 1st of April, which is one of the critical dates. However, for reasons which uh, we have described previously in this debate, the Government has seen fit to cover its own sins and to cover its own inadequacies by putting this into uh, an urgency motion, uh, predominantly to avoid question time and thereby protect uh, weak and ill-performing ministers from uh, that democratic scrutiny at, uh, at two o'clock every day of the parliamentary sitting. However, on top of that, I've been feeling sorry for the minister about this. I've been feeling sorry for the minister around this because, because the, the members opposite might have noticed, but we didn't have question time yesterday. We didn't have question time yesterday. And because of the sting that they received from that in the media, they decided to give in today. But more importantly, Mr Speaker, I've been feeling sorry for the Minister in his uh, presentation of, of, as I say, something that should have been a reasonably pedestrian uh, piece of legislation, because since it was reported back to the, the House, or the Select Committee report was reported back, and now we have had an explosion of antagonism towards students by the government. And so now this minister has to front a perfectly good bill in the context of several depth charges that have been dropped into the tertiary education arena by this government. Let me cite three. First of all, there, is, there was the Prime Minister's statement at the beginning of this parliamentary session in which he said that the government was going to take a careful look at the policy settings around student support. And of course that left everybody to wonder what it meant. Does that mean that in fact the government intends to restrict access to tertiary institutions by not making them open entry after the age of 20? I'll come back to that one in a moment. Does it mean that, in fact, they are intending to make uh, loans and allowances harder to access? And I'll come back to that one in a moment. So there was that set of imponderables to begin with that the government unleashed upon this minister and a perfectly uh, ordinary uh, piece of legislation without uh, being dismissive of it at all, minister. Secondly, the Minister for Tertiary Education was removed from that portfolio. Anne Tolley was taken out of that portfolio and replaced by Stephen Joyce. Stephen Joyce went on to say that, in fact, just recently, last weekend, in the uh, Christchurch Press weekend newspaper, that the student loans policy was in his sights. The student loans policy was in his sights. And what are we meant to take from that? Are we then meant to assume that he also is inclined to make student loans harder to get, thereby limiting access to our tertiary institutions, thereby limiting people's ability to take up educational opportunities, and thereby reducing the cost of tertiary education to the Crown? We on this side of the House say the cost is justified, say that that is an investment that ought to be made by government and ought to be uh, increased in line with other comparable nations as a way of promoting uh, economic growth and development and a way of securing our future. On top of that, 
the government decided to support to first reading the voluntary student membership bill, which was drawn out of the ballot and is Sir Roger Douglas's members' bill. Now, that is an antagonistic gesture as well. In fact, the government, the government has said, we don't know, we're not saying whether we're going to support it at second reading, we're going to support it to first reading, but they could have stymied it in its tracks as they have done with other bills that have been drawn out of the ballot, that have not been given the privilege of going to uh, select committee. So in that context, this minister now has to field a bill and wonders, and, and perhaps people wonder why we've been getting so agitated about a bill that wouldn't normally cause this fuss. It's because it is being dropped into an environment that is now explosive that is now explosive for students. And they have launched, students around the country have launched in response to the Voluntary Student Membership Bill a website called Save Our Services, and they are getting support in the process. But I want to say a couple of other things, particularly about whether or not this government intends to make it harder to access student loans, which this bill expands. If that is the case, then let them say so. If it is the case that they are wanting to make it harder by virtue of ramping up the NCEA qualifications required to get into university, that's one issue. If they are wanting to make it harder to access student loans by ramping up uh, the requirements to pass while at university or Wananga or a Polytech, then that's another issue. But let's be very clear that whichever way they go on it, there will be people who will miss out. I want to quote two examples of people who accessed education after the age of 20 or who accessed education in, uh, not in the usual way of progressing th from school. And I want to demonstrate how important it is. The first person I want to use is the, is the CEO of UCOL, Paul McElroy, who is now in the position of having to turn students away because this government will not renegotiate the student caps and will not invest, will not invest in additional, in additional uh, student places in order to equip our country adequately for the future. And that breaks his heart because his own background, he cites... He says he knows about second chance education firsthand because as a teenager he ran away from home without university entry qualifications and his life was transformed when Wellington Polytechnic took a chance on him. Took a chance on him. He didn't come in through having UE or any kind of uh, entry qualification but the Polytechnic in Wellington in that time took a chance on him and it changed his life. It changed his life. So if this government is proposing that NCEA qualifications be made harder or the threshold be raised and so it is more difficult for people to enter tertiary education, then look at Mr McElroy, who has gone on now to be the CEO of a polytechnic. The second person I want to cite is somebody who came to New Zealand uh, at the age of 23 as a young mother. She in fact uh, needed to uh, do something to improve herself and her prospects. She enrolled in education in, uh, at uh, Massey University. In her first year she passed all her courses. It took her four years to complete her BA and she was awarded a Massey Scholarship as a top graduate in psychology. And a series of courses and scholarships later, having benefited from open entry after 20, she graduated with her PhD. And the rest is a matter of public record. A lectureship at Massey, promotion, a move to Canterbury, six years as a member of parliament, and now eight years running her own research company. That person is, of course, Liz Gordon. And those are examples of people who've contributed to this country by virtue of accessing tertiary education. If this government 
wishes to inhibit Sorry, them, the uh, member's time has expired. 